Ugh. Renal and neurologic problems. Are you feeling the same thing? I'll tell you, it took a long time for me to appreciate the beauty and um, uh, the simplicity of the kidneys. Um, But it turns out that the kidneys get about 25% of the cardiac output. So I think they deserve our attention. That and the fact that they regulate acid-base balance, they regulate uh, fluid and electrolyte balance, they get rid of waste material, they stimulate production of red blood cells. I mean, they're kind of a big deal, right? So let's learn about uh, kidneys. If you're like me, you never liked it because you didn't like adding up eyes and nose. I could never get it right anyway, and that was frustrating. But it's also... Um, because they seem to me to be just too complex to understand. Well, if you have that same feeling, I want to help you today to try to understand um, how the kidneys function, um, have an understanding of the acid-base balance and the flow and electrolyte balance and the forces that are at work at the cellular and tissue level um, to move fluids uh, in and out of the vessels and in and out of cells, etc. So I'm going to help you to understand that today. And then we're also going to talk about urological problems. Um, those are surgical issues. And the big reason to do that is because we have to make friends with the urologists. They have the best jokes in the whole hospital. So the kidneys develop uh, very early in uh, fetal age. There are three components. There's the pronephros, which give rise to the kidney tissues that uh, that eventually end up in the metanephros, which is the um, functional kidney. In fact, we know that by three months uh, of gestation, there is urine formation. And here is just this cool picture that they uh, published in the New England Journal a couple years ago. Well, 23 years ago. Um, And it shows this stream coming out of uh, this thing, which turns out to be a penis. So this is a uh, intrauterine ultrasound that showed um, this linear thing coming out of this penis. Well, they put color on it which uh, indicates flow, and uh, turns out that was uh, urinary output from a penis there, which I thought was kind of cool. The New England Journal publishes stuff like that. I think I showed you one before. The, uh, uh, in the neuro section, we, I showed you that picture of the kid who touched the sole of his foot and gave himself the Babinski response. That was in the New England Journal also. So in any case, um, these are the stages of kidney development. Remember that fluid distribution um, is a function partly of the kidneys. About two thirds of the body fluids are intracellular. What surprises me is that 25% of the body fluid is interstitial. Can you imagine? 25% is interstitial in the third space. I thought we weren't supposed to have anything in the third space, right? Well, it turns out we do, and it's quite a bit of fluid in that third space. So fluid balance um, has to be uh, a balance between daily loss and daily intake. So daily intake is, you know, two or three liters a day, and that um, gets um, divided between fluid intake, food intake, and then there's some water that's produced during metabolism, right, during the metabolic process. So for instance, this is just to tease you and get you ready for the Uh, the rest of this today. In the liver, the liver makes BUN. Well, it makes BUN because it combines ammonia, which is a product of protein metabolism, plus CO2, and you get blood urea nitrogen plus, guess what? Water. Got to balance the equations, right? Stoichiometry, remember that from chemistry? Always got to balance your equation. Make sure you got the right stuff on both sides. So um, so water is produced about 300 cc's um, from metabolic processes, such as creation of BUN. Um, the electrolytes exist in different concentrations in different uh, parts of the body, right? In different uh, silos, so to speak. So remember that cations, which I always thought should be cations, but whatever, cations uh, 
um, are positively charged, anions are negatively charged, and they exist in two spaces. They exist either extracellularly or intracellularly. Well, we remember from uh, talking about uh, uh, neural uh, signal transmission and uh, cardiac dysrhythmias, etc., that the majority of the cation that's extracellular is sodium, and the majority that's intracellular is potassium, right? Well, there's also anions that go along with those. So phosphate is an intracellular substance and chloride tends to be um, in higher concentrations outside the cell. So the major anions plus the major cations form a homeostatic mechanism, right? When the cation charge equals the anion charge, uh, that is uh, homeostasis. There's also homeostasis between intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid. And guess what it is that regulates that? Tonicity of the water. So tonicity is influenced by the amount of particles, uh, the amount of sol solute that is in that solution. Okay. A euosmotic cell, check this out. So a euosmotic cell that has just the right amount of sodium inside it and potassium inside it and all the electrons inside of it that is surrounded by pure water with no electrolytes whatsoever. In that system, there is a 5,400 millimeter of mercury pressure differential across that cell membrane. 5,400 millimeters of mercury. Those are the same units we use to measure blood pressure. It's a huge pressure. So if you were thinking that the um, uh, concentration of ions doesn't have much of an effect on uh, pressures and movement of fluid, you were dead wrong. It has a huge effect. In fact, it has a bigger effect than blood pressure does. Again, a euosmotic cell, that is a cell that has just the right amount of um, intracellular ions. If you put that cell into a bucket of pure water, pure water with no electrolytes in it, the pressure exerted on that cell membrane would be 5,400 millimeters of mercury, just because of the differential between the highly concentrated ions and the zero concentrated ions. It's enormous, enormous pressures. These are very powerful forces at work. So an isotonic solution is one where the concentration of ions is the same in the solution as it is inside the cell. And as a result, there's no movement of water back and forth. And remember, it's water that moves in response to um, these concentrations of ions. It's the water that moves, not the ions. So again, an isotonic solution, we have the same concentration of um, particles in the solution as we do inside the cell membrane. A hypotonic solution is where there are fewer, fewer of these ions in the solution than there are inside the cell. And so when we put a normal cell into a hypotonic solution, then the cell swells because the fluid is what's moving, right? The fluid moves inside the cell to try to dilute what it thinks, what the fluid thinks is this um, uh, hypertonic uh, uh, amount inside the cell. So a hypotonic solution where there's fewer particles in the fluid will force fluid into the relatively higher concentrated uh, solution that's inside the cell, and that causes cell swelling to occur, right? The opposite is also true. When you have a hypertonic solution, 
salt water, for instance, a hypertonic salt water solution like 3% saline, that is going to force the fluid from inside the cell, which it thinks is, um, you know, relatively hypotonic in relation to the fluid. It's going to force that water out to try to dilute the fluid out here. Make sense? You think about it. If it didn't make sense, play that back again, because I think uh, if you listen to it a time or two, that'll help you. Now, I want you to understand that there are several forces at work. And you probably, if you're like me, had no clue what the difference between osmotic and oncotic pressure was. And it was just confusing. And, oh, the blood pressure has something to do with it, too. Well, it does. So the osmotic pressure is the pressure that we just talked about. That is the pressure that is defined by the number of particles in solution and the um, ionization of that fluid, all right? So these are non-proteins that are dissolved in the blood. In this case, uh, when we calculate the serum osmolality, we calculate it by this um, uh, formula. Two times the sodium, so this is a pretty important number, right? The sodium is hugely important. And then we add in the component of the BUN and the component of the glucose and the component of any alcohol and add that all up together and we get the serum osmolality. The serum osmolality is the force acting to push fluids in or out of cells, okay? It's the force that acts to move fluid in or out of cells. Now, when we talk about the capillary, we're talking about two other forces. One force that pushes water out, that's the blood pressure or the hydrostatic pressure. And another force that holds the fluid inside the vessel. And that is the osmotic pressure. Now, just to confuse things, they also call it the colloid osmotic pressure, which is stupid, but anyway. The oncotic pressure, think of proteins, all right? This is the um, concentration of protein in a solution, and that is the force that acts to keep the fluid inside the vessel, okay? So in this case, we're going to think about serum albumin. And clinically speaking, you've all seen patients with super low albumins. They come in, they have that mushy edema that just, you, you know, it pits as soon as you touch it. Uh, and it stays pitted for an extended period of time. Um, that's that mushy hypoalbumin, hypo, hypoalbuminemic? Yeah, that's right. Hypoalbuminemic um, mushy um, edema. So... How do we calculate the oncotic pressure? I don't know. It's magic. Somebody does it. But let's just think about the serum albumin. And when we calculate the, uh, when we talk about the oncotic pressure, we're just going to look at the serum albumin and that will help us figure out if they are um, at normal oncotic pressure or low. All right. All right. So those are the three forces at work. This osmotic pressure works on moving fluids in or out of the cells. The hydrostatic pressure pushes fluid out of the capillaries. And the oncotic pressure is the opposite of hydrostatic, well, it, it opposes hydrostatic pressure and tries to hold the liquids in the vascular space, okay? It's that concentration of protein that helps to hold that fluid in. So how do we maintain homeostasis? Well, we talked about this briefly, but you know, there's a lot of things that are responsible for um, getting fluid out. We get fluid through the skin, we breathe out a certain amount of fluid. These are the, um, uh, the insensible losses that we have. And then there's sensible loss that we can measure in uh, bowel loss and um, loss from kidneys, right? And then of course we have to think about um, all the different ways that we take fluid in. Usually, for those of us at home, it's just fluid intake by mouth. Um, but we also have to, uh, in hospitalized patients, we have to think about fluid intake uh, in other ways as well. So let's talk briefly about the normal anatomy of the body. 
Um, you know that the uh, liver, uh, I'm sorry, the kidneys live in the retroperitoneal space. They are not abdominal organs. They are behind the peritoneum. And so they are retroperitoneal structures as, is, uh, as are the aorta and the vena cava. So, uh, and some other things too, like part of the intestine, part of the large bowel is back there. The pancreas is back there. There's some other structures that are um, uh, retroperitoneal structures. But it's important because if there's some damage to the kidneys and trauma, for instance, you can lose a ton of blood. Remember, they carry 25% of the cardiac output. You can lose a ton of blood from a ruptured kidney uh, in the retroperitoneal space and never know about it until it's too late. All right, so keep that in mind. They are retroperitoneal structures. What is the composition of the kidney? Well, they all have this kind of structure. Sometimes they have more arteries. There are patients who have three renal arteries. Uh, by the way, they're hard to transplant too. You gotta find somebody else with three renal arteries. They're out there, but, uh, but they're not all uh, easily recognized. The renal artery and the renal vein uh, come together here in the kidney to supply blood uh, to the nephrons, which are the functional unit. Other important components of this are the renal pelvis, where all of the urine empties, and then the um, ureter that leads to the bladder. Now, the functional unit here is the nephron. The nephron consists of the glomerulus, which is blood flow. This is arterial blood flow that comes into the uh, glomerulus through the afferent, a meaning before, right? Afferent arteriole. And then the efferent arteriole takes the blood away from the glomerulus. And then it goes around the, um, uh, it goes around the, uh, distal and the proximal tubules and lupa henle, etc. So that cascade of vessels um, meets up with the vein as well, uh, and there's capillaries that are formed that do the dirty work of the kidney, right? The functional work of the kidney. The nephron itself starts. Um, the process of urine formation by sending blood to the afferent arteriole that goes to the glomerulus. And then the glomerulus just spills out uh, essentially plasma, right? It, it essentially just dumps plasma into the uh, collecting duct, that the beginning of which is called Bowman's capsule. And Bowman's capsule then leads to the proximal tubule. And the proximal tubule is surrounded by all this capillary system where all the busy work gets done. Then the proximal, caps, uh, proximal tubule gives rise to the loop of Henle, the proximal loop, the distal loop, and then it goes to the distal convoluted tubule where again it's surrounded by this capillary structure and then uh, the urine gets formed into the collecting tubule. So the filtrate, we refer to the filtrate as the stuff that gets dumped from here, almost essentially plasma, that gets dumped directly into Bowman's capsule. That's the filtrate. And then that goes through this duct, and by the time it gets to here, it's urine. But there's a lot of steps in between. I'm going to show you those steps. So the glomerulus uses these pressures that we just talked about. It uses the hydrostatic pressure, that's the blood pressure, right? And it uses the colloid osmotic pressure or the oncotic pressure to um, regulate the fluid movement at Bowman's capsule. And so the net filtration pressure is the glomerular hydrostatic pressure, that's the blood pressure at the glomerulus, minus the Bowman's capsule pressure, minus the glomerular oncotic pressure. All right, all of those together um, uh, are used to calculate the net filtration pressure. And that tells us how much urine gets formed. So glomerular filtration, is uh, also known as the GFR. 
And so the GFR is this complicated um, uh, formula here, but at the end of which we get uh, a glomerular filtration rate in milliliters per minute. It's a difficult thing to measure, right? We don't really have a way to measure it, so we need to estimate it. Well, there's a ton of different ways to estimate it, but the one that we tend to use the most is this um, formula that they came up with uh, in the uh, modification of diet and renal disease study or the MDRD study. And in that study, they took into account a whole lot of things. So let me just back up and explain to you that, you know, if we're going to just do a spot check of the kidneys and I want to know how healthy my kidneys are, I'm going to look at what number? I'm going to look at the creatinine, right? That's the spot check that we use. And we use it in the hospital and we follow it along, you know, um, longitudinally because it, it gives us an idea about somebody's kidney function. But somebody who's big and muscular, like me, right? Just kidding. But somebody who's big and muscular has a much higher creatinine because they're processing more protein and more protein breakdown than a little old lady who doesn't walk and is bed bound with very low muscle uh, tone and very low um, um, muscular content. So how can I look at my creatinine and her creatinine next to each other and know that uh, you know, know which one of us has better renal function. Or if we both have a creatinine of uh, 1.1, what does that mean? If I have a creatinine of 1.1 and I'm a muscle-bound bodybuilder, that's probably pretty good, right? But if I'm a little old lady who's lying in bed and has no muscle mass, a 1.1 creatinine is probably dangerous. And in fact, I had this very thing happen um, just last week at, at work, I had a 90-year-old woman who had a creatinine of 1.2. And um, I told her, you know, I'm concerned about, she came in with chest pain. Turns out it was the real deal. She definitely was um, uh, in need of uh, catheterization, but I didn't want to kill her kidneys. So I said, you know, I'm concerned about this because, you know, you would have a high chance of needing um, uh, dialysis after catheterization. She said, but I don't understand. I didn't know that my kidneys were no good. I said, your kidneys are fine, but you have 90 year old kidneys. Your creatinine is 1.2, not awful. But when I did the math that this equation provides, I could tell that she had very poor kidney function. Her, uh, GFR was, uh, around 35, and giving her a dose of um, uh, IV contrast uh, had the potential to lead her to dialysis. So I tell you that story because a creatinine of 1.2 doesn't make people always look and, and worry. But when you do the math that's taken into account by this GFR calculation, it makes sense. So it is a function, the GFR is a function in this equation of the age, the serum creatinine, and by the way, it has to be a stable serum creatinine. This is not one, this is not a calculation that you do during an acute renal failure episode. So stable creatinine, the BUN, the albumin, because that's a function of it too, the sex, and the race, because we know that blacks uh, tend to have higher serum creatinines uh, than, um, than whites. And so we plug all that in and we turn the crank and out pops a number. And that number is the GFR. We're going to use the GFR later on today when we talk about the, um, uh, when we talk about the, uh, levels of chronic kidney disease. Now I want to get back to talking about the urine and the filtrate and all that jazz. I don't expect you to memorize this, but I want you to appreciate all the stuff that's going on in the kidney, 
all right, during the production of urine. So first of all, you should know that two thirds of that filtrate, again, which is mostly just raw um, plasma, about two thirds of that filtrate ends up getting reabsorbed back again in the proximal tubule. Well, let's just trace what happens in each segment of the nephron and see what's going on with the concentration of each of these things uh, that's in the filtrate, all right? Or what will become urine by the time we get to here. So when we first dump all this stuff out, we have a concentration that is about equal in amino acids, glucose, proteins, bicarb, uh, potassium, sodium, chloride, creatinine, and urea, right? So they all come out here at a concentration of one. But during their transit through the proximal tubule, the capillary system pulls stuff out and adds stuff back in. Well, what it pulls out is the glucose, the protein, and the amino acids, because we don't want that stuff going out uh, and getting lost in the kidney or in the urine. So we want to reclaim that stuff. And that's the job of the proximal tubule. It reclaims um, a huge portion of the glucose, protein, and amino acids. It also reclaims a decent amount of bicarb, but remember the kidneys have to balance the amount of bicarb that's available. That's a really important function of the kidneys uh, to maintain acid-base balance. And to maintain acid-base balance in certain conditions, it needs to hold on to more bicarb, and in certain conditions, it needs to get rid of more bicarb. Not much happens to sodium and potassium, but look what happens to creatinine. The proximal tubule actually takes that concentration of creatinine and adds to it. It actually adds more creatinine back in. And same with urea, okay? Get to the loop of Henle, and this is where the sodium and potassium really start to change, right? Along with the chloride. And you know that because this is where loop diuretics work. And we know that when we use loop diuretics, sorry, when we use loop diuretics, we lose a ton of potassium. And the reason that the diuretic work is because we lose a ton of sodium. Along with sodium moves fluid, right? Moves water. So that's what's going on in the loop of Henle. But look what else happens here. This huge increase in the amount of urea that gets into the filtrate. And that just keeps going up. So that blood urea nitrogen or the urea continues to increase in concentration in what becomes the urine by the time it gets here. Okay. Now, after the loop of Henle, there's a, uh, or in the second half, in the ascending loop of Henle, there is a sudden decrease in the concentration of sodium and potassium because the loop of Henle says, whoa, we got to hold on to this stuff. We can't dump it all. You know, we got rid of some urine. That's good. But now we got to reclaim um, some of the sodium and potassium. And so that's what happens here. But remember, the job of the kidney, in addition to many other things, is to get rid of potassium. So when it gets to the distal tubule, that's where the majority of this, uh, of this potassium is lost, in the distal tubule and the collecting tubule. Okay? So that is um, how the urine is formed. Um, again, I don't expect you to memorize this, but I want you to have an appreciation for the fact that in the proximal tubule, there's reabsorption of glucose, protein, and amino acids, because those things we don't want to get rid of. We want to keep them in there, except when we talk about certain drugs like SGLT2 inhibitors, where we want to spill glucose here, but that's for later on. All right. And then the other thing is that we want to get rid of creatinine and we want to facilitate loss of urea. Uh, throughout the rest of the kidney, and that's what happens here. So, in the proximal convoluted tubule, all these actions are happening. Now, remember, it takes ATP, right? It requires energy for the sodium potassium pump to work. The glucose comes out. Remember, it's being reabsorbed from the filtrate, gets reabsorbed, and goes back into the bloodstream over here. Same with amino acids. Same with bicarb, same with some of the water, same with some chloride, 
All of those things are happening in these renal epithelial cells. Okay, those are the cells that line um, the um, uh, the renal tubules. Remember, I talked about SGLT2, right? There is a specific kind of um, diabetes, and by the way, heart failure drug called an SGLT2 inhibitor. And what that does is it works to um, decrease the function of the SGLT2 site in the proximal tubule. And it makes the kidney hold on to, uh, I'm sorry, makes the uh, filtrate hold on to sodium and glucose. So these patients tend to pee out more and a lot of the glucose um, that would otherwise end up back in their bloodstream, right here, ends up uh, in the urine. So the SGLT2 receptor is responsible for pulling out sodium and pulling out glucose and putting them back into the capillary. And the way that the SGLT2 drugs work, SGLT2 inhibitor drugs work, is by blocking this mechanism, okay? and they get rid of more sodium and glucose that way, which is great for heart failure, it's great for diabetes, and it's great for diabetics who happen to have heart failure, right? That's like even the best thing. Now remember that bicarb um, is the most important component in acid-base regulation. It takes a long time for it to start to work, but when it works, it works um, very powerfully. And bicarb reabsorption is an important component of maintaining acid-base balance. So I'll let you read this stuff on your own, but essentially what's going on here is that this um, uh, bicarb comes into the filtrate, mixes with hydrogen ions, right? Because it's gonna take care of any acidemia that exists. And so the, uh, I'm sorry, the hydrogen ions come out of uh, the bloodstream and go directly in, where is it? Uh, I don't see it on here. But in any case, the hydrogen, ion, oh, it's from this reaction here. So uh, the hydrogen ions come off of here from the uh, carboxylate and go into the filtrate where they mix with the bicarb and then that becomes H2CO3. And that then comes back in, we can get rid, mixes with CO2, uh, I'm sorry, um, changes into water and CO2, and then it continues this reaction that we're gonna talk about more with, um, uh, with the uh, acid-base balance. But this, this happens in the renal tubule and uh, is a very important component of acid-base balance. Remember the kidney has a major role in getting rid of excess potassium. Potassium cannot float around freely in the uh, bloodstream because it's bad for you, right? We want potassium to be intracellular where it can't do any harm. But once the cells are full, of potassium, they don't want any more, then the potassium floats around in the bloodstream and does things like make your heart stop. That's not so good. So the kidney's job, among others, is to get rid of that potassium. And the way that it does it is um, by secreting that potassium, um, again, through the sodium potassium pump in the uh, renal cells, and then that potassium gets dumped into the lumen here and it disappears in the urine, okay? Another important thing that happens then is uh, ADH, the effects of ADH on water, right? So all the other stuff that we talked about, there's um, uh, electrolytes that are pushing water around. Well, in this case, we have ADH that's doing the work. And so what happens here is that the ADH molecule hooks up to vasopressin 2, right? The vasopressin 2 receptor um, creates a second messenger then, cyclic AMP, that goes to the aquaporin 2 
goes to aquaporin 2. Aquaporin 2 then facilitates the movement of water from the collecting tubule back into the bloodstream. And that is the way that antidiuretic hormone uh, maintains fluid volume in the blood. All right, so that's kind of the long and the short of how the um, ion transport happens in the kidneys. Um, I think you'll agree it's kind of a beautiful system, right? I mean, it's it really is uh, a fascinating thing that happens. Well, another fascinating thing that happens is acid-base balance. So just to refresh your memory, and I don't want to bore you, but remember that the pH is a logarithmic function. Right. If we were to calculate the concentration or measure the concentration of um, hydrogen ions, it would be 0.0000004 equivalents per liter. Well, we can't do that. That's too much. Like, I can't keep track of all those numbers. I can't keep track of four kids. How am I going to keep track of all that stuff? So we use a logarithmic function and change that into the uh, log of hydrogen, the negative log of hydrogen ions. All right. And that's just an easier thing for us to do. So we define the pH or the potential hydrogen as the pKa plus the log of the bicarb divided by H2CO3 or carbonic acid. All right. And this ratio exists in a 20 to 1, 20 bicarbonate uh, ions to um, 1 carbonic acid. When we do all the math, plug all the numbers in, we come up with an ideal pH of 7.4. I don't expect you to know the math. I didn't even do the math here. I didn't show you any of the math. I just showed you the formula. This is how we do it. Uh, and at the end, we get the pH, normal pH 7.4. Okay. Now, what does 7.4 mean? Well, on this scale, this balance scale, we can see a couple things that we've already talked about. One is the pH of 7.4, right? And the range, because, you know, we're not perfect, right? Nobody's perfect. The range of normal is 7.38 to 7.42. But if we're going to pick a perfect number, it's 7.4. That's the perfect pH. The other thing that we recognize here that we just talked about is this one part carbonic acid to 20 parts of bicarbonate. So this is the balance that makes all of this work. One part of carbonic acid, this is the acid component, to 20 parts of bicarbonate, which is the base component. And when those things are in equilibrium, we have a nice normal pH of 7.4. But when we stop breathing so much, or when we have a metabolic process, the acidemia happens. And just to um, clarify, if you're on rounds at the ICU at Penn, like I used to be, and you get asked about the um, uh, acidosis or acidemia, the number that you're talking about in the blood that that is the that is acidemia when we're talking about what's going on in the blood the presence of acid in the blood is acidemia once you do all the figuring and you come up with the uh, diagnosis that is metabolic acidosis right once you attach the other word to it it goes from being acidemia which is what you see going on in the blood to acidosis which is the clinical condition um, uh, associated with uh, acidemia okay that's just one of those things that you don't want to get embarrassed by using the wrong terminology so again um, if there's some decrease uh, breathing which builds up the co2 which is an acid that's going to push you from here over into the acidemia category if there's um, buildup of lactic acid or acetyl salicylic acid if you're poisoned then that puts you over here in the acidemia category as well all right and if you blow off too much co2 or you have too much bicarb 
that puts you over here in the alkalosis world. And notice that once you get past a pH of 6.8, you're just dead. Like that's unrecoverable. And a pH greater than 7.8, dead. So these are the things that your body um, relies on in order to maintain this acid-base balance. Now remember, there are buffers that float around in the bloodstream. Those are immediately available. So there's some carbonic acid and there's some bicarb that floats around in your bloodstream. Those are immediately available for your body to use to um, address acid or base um, discrepancies. But they're used up immediately and to remake them takes days. It takes days. The lung component, which is CO2, right? Blowing off CO2 or conserving CO2, that happens within hours. That's an easier thing for your body to handle. But the kidney component takes days to reproduce that bicarb. And you know that process that it gets bicarb, I just showed you in the, um, uh, in the last or a couple of slides ago. So the buffer is immediate. It's uh, a function of the concentration of bicarb plus the acid in the blood. That is the uh, concentration of hydrogen ions. That's in, um, in equilibrium with H2CO3, which is carbonic acid. And then through this process that uses carbonic anhydrase, right? This is a, um, uh, an enzyme that catalyzes this reaction. It takes this uh, carbonic acid and converts it into CO2 plus water. This is one of those metabolic processes that produces water. When you add carbonic anhydrase to carbonic acid, it makes CO2 plus H2O. Carbonic acid gives off hydrogen ions to make blood more acidic. And it does this process to um, take up hydrogen ions. Okay. All right. The lung component, again, when hydrogen ion increases in the blood, the chemoreceptors in the brain are stimulated. That makes you hyperventilate, blow off CO2, which is an also, which also is an acid and that makes the blood less acidic. The PaCO2, that's the partial pressure of arterial carbon dioxide, um, tells us how well the body is excreting carbonic acid, essentially, right? Because when there's enough carbonic acid, um, that affects the breathing rate and the loss or the uh, gain of CO2. And then finally, the kidney component takes days, requires functioning kidneys. One of the things that lets us know that we need to get um, our patient to um, dialysis is whether they are acidemic. So when you have metabolic acidosis that's persistent and unfixable, no matter how much bicarb we give, that's an indication that the patient needs uh, dialysis. Why do they need dialysis? Because their kidneys are broken, right? So remember that um, that bicarb requires functioning kidneys. To make bicarb, it requires functioning kidneys. Remember that for every hydrogen ion secreted into the renal tubule, one bicarb ion is reabsorbed into the blood. This is an efficient system, but by no means a super fast one. And that's why it takes so long for this balance to occur. And it can be easily overwhelmed. So in salicylate poisoning, for instance, the real issue is acidosis, right? These patients become acidotic and their kidneys can't um, make up time fast enough uh, to be able to produce enough bicarb ions. All right. So in summary, you can see it uh, summarized here. CO2 is transported in um, dissolved, you know, it's dissolved as PCO2, uh, about 7% of it. About 23% um, is 
carboxylated hemoglobin and then the rest of the co2 is present in this bicarb ion okay uh, the red blood cells participate in this process as well uh, as do the kidneys and the lungs to maintain co uh, to maintain acid base balance and you can plot all of this stuff with uh, with this graph so here we have on the y-axis arterial plasma concentration of uh, bicarb ions on the x-axis we have the blood ph and then on these red lines we have the concentration of um, uh, dissolved co2 the pacO2 and so if I have a pCO2 of 40 and I have a uh, oops dang it sorry uh, so we have a p oh, this thing bothers me so much sorry I have this magic mouse that I'm doing this uh, on my computer with and it's annoying so here is a pCO2 of 40 along this red line pco2 of 40 and that would give this patient a uh, hemoglobin i'm sorry a bicarb of 34 with a ph of 7.5 so i can use this to calculate exactly where it is but there's other ways to do it too um, this gives you one of those ways that helps you to think this process through. I'll let you look at that on your own. But I want to get to this part where I tell you about the marching metabolics. If everything goes wrong and you're stuck on rounds and somebody's pointing at you, waiting for you to uh, tell the group uh, whether, you know, what kind of acid base abnormality someone has, uh, here's the way to cheat and figure it out quick. When the pH and the pCO2 go in opposite directions, that's a respiratory process. But you start by looking at what the bicarb is doing because it's the last to change. If the bicarb is going in the same direction as the pH, that is a metabolic process. So if the pH goes down, that's acidosis, right? So this is a metabolic acidosis. When the bicarb goes down and the pH goes down. It's metabolic alkalosis if the pH goes up and the bicarb goes up, okay? So the marching metabolics are what I uh, refer to this as. And I can easily tell in somebody with acute acid-base abnormality um, what's going on here. I can tell that this is a metabolic process because the uh, bicarb is going in the same direction as the pH, okay? So... When you evaluate these um, uh, acid-base abnormalities, start with the knowledge that a perfect pH is 7.4. If the pH of the patient is 7.42, it's an alkalotic process. If the pH of the patient is 7.38, it's an acidotic process, right? Um, if the pCO2 is 40, that's perfect. But if it's in this range, it's still normal, as is this range, still normal. Um, but it's going to be on the range of, um, you know, a respiratory component or not. And then the bicarb should ideally be 24. And if it's in this range, that's acceptable. Um, but it's going to be on the side. Unless it's 24, it's going to be on the uh, metabolic side or not. Okay. That's how that works. So now, lastly, um, for this section, I just want you to think about acidosis and alkalosis. And if you think about what's going on in these conditions, it should make it very clear to you, um, you know, why it's happening. So think about metabolic acidosis. In metabolic acidosis, well, first of all, when the pH is 7.4, the CO2 is 40, the bicarb is 24, when all of those things are perfectly normal, that's homeostasis, right? Everybody lives together in peace and harmony and the angels sing and the birds chirp and all that. That's perfect. When there's a problem, though, it falls into one of these four categories. 
if the body is making acid, right? If it's making acid, then that is a metabolic process, okay? Does that make sense? Well, it makes sense because if I'm making acid from uh, ATN or, uh, or I'm in shock, for instance, um, those are reasons that I would have metabolic acidosis because I'm making acid for some reason. Diarrhea is the most common cause uh, in the outpatient kind of world. Um, uh, but there are some medicines that can do it too, like uh, uh, acetazolamide, spironolactone, one of our anti-aldosterone drugs. So all of these should probably, I mean, they should just sort of make sense to you that we're making extra acid for some reason uh, in these conditions. And if you want to memorize them, you can memorize them by memorizing hard ups, H-A-R-D-U-P-S, okay? In respiratory acidosis, the CO2 is going up because we're not breathing as much, right? Our respiratory rate has decreased and, um, or I should say our ventilation has decreased, right? Maybe our respiratory rate has increased, but maybe it's decreased. Um, but if we have pneumonia and there's, no, there's less gas exchange, then that's gonna effectively cause decreased breathing, right? Less gas exchange means there's more CO2 building up, as would happen with an airway obstruction or CNS depression or pulmonary edema. Anything that impairs gas exchange is gonna cause uh, hypoventilation. Contrast that with what's going on in respiratory alkalosis, which is blowing off too much CO2. I remember being a kid, uh, I couldn't have been more than six or so, and my mom was a nurse, and we went to Hershey Park one night, and somebody was on one of those scary rides and um, uh, was having a, having a panic attack afterwards. And um, I remember my mom, now this was in the 1970s, right? And my, I remember my mom uh, got a paper bag and put it over the person's mouth and helped them to sort of um, keep more CO2 so that their tingling lips and fingers and their anxiety, you know, it gave them something to concentrate on to slow down their breathing and doing all that stuff helped them to retain more CO2 and the symptoms improved, um, uh, you know, the, the symptoms of respiratory alkalosis, the numbness and tingling and all that jazz. Um, so I just remember that that was, uh, that paper bag was helping that person to hold on to more CO2 uh, and that's what I remember. So all of these things go along with that. CNS disease, hypoxia, anxiety, um, having the mechanical ventilator set incorrectly, uh, sepsis, the, you know, all of those kind of things can cause uh, respiratory alkalosis, okay? Uh, and then that leaves metabolic alkalosis. And actually there was just a case report in the New England Journal a couple of months ago uh, about a licorice death um, from somebody uh, ingesting only candy, only licorice um, for a period of several months. And he ended up dying. I mean, it was pretty, pretty interesting. So you can look that up. Um, don't eat too much licorice. It's a bad thing. The most commonly seen thing with this um, metabolic alkalosis is vomiting. You lose too much um, stomach acid, that causes a metabolic alkalosis, and um, uh, and so vomiting is the thing that you should think of uh, as the major cause of that. Sorry, one last thing. The anion gap is another thing that we need to consider. There's um, normal gap acidosis. So if you take the sodium and subtract the chloride and the bicarb, um, you should have a gap that is um, less than, or I'm sorry, that is, yeah, less than 12. I think it's like three to 12 or something like that. So if you have a gap, that is if the um, answer you get from this equation is greater than 12, you have a gap acidosis and you should look for these causes. A gap acidosis is caused frequently by uh, salicylate overdose ethylene glycol, alcohol, 
lactic acidosis, all of these cause an anion gap acidosis. That is where um, the sodium is out of proportion to these other uh, electrolytes in the blood. Okay, so again, you can memorize this if you're so inclined by memorizing cat mud piles. Um, uh, but these are all the different causes, potential causes of anion gap acidosis.